Now that we have a good understanding of the internal genitalia of a female, we're going to discuss the external, external genitalia. And before I get started, I want, we're going to talk about specific structures, but all the structures in this area are going to be covered with skin. There are differences between the areas, dependent on whether the skin has associated hair or sudoriferous glands, sebaceous glands, but all of this area is going to have a high amount of sensory innervation. And that's particularly important in terms of sexual arousal and allowing for those erectile s tissues associated with the clitoris to become engorged and to, um, and to become erect. So let's start with the mons pubis. And mons means mountain, so mons equals mountain. And you can see right here, this is going to be one of the more anteriorly placed components of the external genitalia. And underneath is a high amount or a large amount of adipose tissue or fat. And in this area you're going to have a high amount of sebaceous glands, so you remember sebaceous glands mean oil glands, as well as sudoriferous glands or sweat glands. And these specific types of sudoriferous glands are going to be those apocrine that are associated with the smell associated with it, which is different than the eccrine glands that you have in the majority of your body. Now if you continue, kind of posterior or inferiorly, you're going to have two folds of skin referred to as the labia majora. And this is really just a continuation of the mons pubis as you move inferior posteriorly. Like the mons pubis, this is going to have skin associated with it, as well as variable amounts of adipose tissue deep to the skin in this area. Now as we move medially, you're going to have smaller folds of skin. These are referred to as the labia minora, and as its name would suggest, these are going to be smaller than the labia majora. And you can see right here, this is going to be on either side and kind of those um, lateral boundaries of the vulva or the, ves uh, the vestibule. So the labia minora, what's different here as opposed to the labia majora is this is going to be hairless skin. And also, you're not going to have a lot of those sweat glands, you're not going to have a lot of those sudoriferous glands, but you do have high frequency of sebaceous glands or those oily glands, and that can serve as kind of a lubricant in this area. Now, one thing I want to note before I move on in terms of this, so the labia minora here, you can see it continuing anteriorly into this larger structure, and this is referred to as the clitoris. The clitoris, um, one thing that you don't have in this particular picture here, is what we refer to as the prepus. And that is just the skin that's going to cover the majority of the clitoris, which is referred to as the body of the clitoris. Now the body of the clitoris is made up of almost exclusively erectile tissues, and specifically that erectile tissue we're going to refer to as the corpus cavernosa. And what will happen is uh, during sexual excitement or sexual arousal, the blood vessels will dilate, allowing for blood to enter into this region, allowing for it to engorge and to become erect in this region. So you can see the majority of the body right here. And just as reference, your labia minora is kind of this further extension up into the clitoris, which is going to be anterior. Now right over here, this region right here is referred to as the glans clitoris. It's just a dilation of um, the most distal portion of the body of the clitoris. So right here, this is all referred to as erectile tissue, and we're going to talk about the erectile tissues that are going to be on either side as well, and we refer to those as the crura, or the cruce of the clitoris, depending on whether you're talking about both sides, which would be the crura, and if you're only talking about either the right or the left side, that would be referred to as the cruce. Now one thing before we move on, the clitoris is purely um, an erectile tissue. There is nothing associated with uh, ur uh, urine excretion in this region, which is what you would have in terms of the penis of the male. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the vestibule. And the vestibule is just this area right here 
that is an opening and it allows for two main orifices or the exit of both urine as well as menstrual flow. So we're going to start with the more anterior of the two and that's the external urethral orifice. So just to get an idea of where we're at, this is going to be posterior to the clitoris, which is right here, and then anterior to the vaginal orifice. And it's considerably smaller than the vaginal orifice, which takes up the majority of the vestibule. On either side of the external urethral orifice, you're going to have what we refer to as periurethral glands. Sometimes you'll hear these referred to as Skene's glands. And like we have in all of our courses, this is an eponym meaning this area was named after the individual that described it. In most in anatomy currently, we really try to move away from using these eponyms. So on either side of this uh, external urethral orifice, you'll have these periurethral glands that will uh, secrete small amounts of mucus in this region. And actually, these periurethral glands are going to be a homologue to the male prostate. Okay, so now we're going to move posteriorly to the vaginal orifice, and like I said previously, the vaginal orifice is going to be considerably larger than the urethral orifice. It's going to be bordered by the hymen, and when the hymen has been broken, uh, you'll have what's referred to as the hymen or hymenal caruncle, which is just a remnant of that hymen. On either side of the vaginal orifice, you're going to have what's referred to as greater vestibular glands, which will secrete kind of a lubricant in that area, uh, which will help in terms of any type of entrance of anything into the vaginal orifice. Typically, the, uh, the, those secretions will occur during sexual excitement or sexual arousal. Now, we're looking at an illustration here, and there's two things going on here. In this particular image, we're only looking at the erectile tissues. So this is going to be deep. Whereas in this, these two images down here, these are going to be muscles that are going to be covering these erectile tissues. So these are going to be more superficially located than the, the top portion of this image. Now, we've already, we have, we're going to discuss the male erectile tissues, but these are really going to be homologs of one another. They just have slightly different names depending on whether you're talking about male or female. And so, once again, let's talk about the clitoris here. Like I said, the majority of the clitoris is what we refer to as uh, the body of the clitoris. And then on either side, we have... Uh, what we refer to as these crura. So you can see they're really attaching to this ischiopubic ramus, so the part of the bone right here. And these are going to be covered um, when we're talking about uh, the associated here. This is kind of associated with what we refer to as the corpus spongiosum, or homologous spongiosum. I'm going to spell this right. And then the crura are going to be associated with the corpus cavernosum. So these are just the specific um, terminology associated with the erectile tissues. So you have all these spaces and all these sinuses within these erectile tissues that allow for blood to be able to fill in those sinuses in that region. Now, <clears throat> also of note here, you're going to have the bulb of the vestibule. This is going to be on either side of the vestibule, so these are erectile tissues as well. And you can see, when we're talking about the crura, the ischiocavernosus is going to cover uh, the, that erectile tissue. And then in terms of the bulb of the vestibule, the bulbospongiosum, which makes sense, it has bulb within its name, is going to cover the bulb of the vestibule. And so when that bulbospongiosis contracts, that's going to put pressure on anything that is entering into the vaginal orifice. Now looking quickly again here in a bit more detail with this bulb of the vestibule, this is going to be deep to the labia minora, the, that's the smaller lips or folds in that region, and lateral to the vaginal orifice. And this is just going to be similar to what we, to, or it's going to be homologous to the bulb of the penis, which is composed of the corpus spongiosum erectile tissue. 
Now, as you would probably think, there's going to be a great abundance of arterial supply in this region, and really it can be separated into what's supplying the superior portion of the vulva and the inferior portion of the vulva. So when we're talking about superior branches, these are all going to be branches, or almost all going to be branches of the femoral artery. And remember, let's think back in terms of understanding from where the femoral artery branches. The femoral artery is a branch of your external iliac artery. Whereas what's supplying the inferior portion of the vulva is going to be your internal pudendal artery, which is a branch of your internal iliac artery. So um, even though it's not the, the big branches of the femoral or the internal pudendal, it's smaller branches that are going to supply all of these structures in this area. Now in terms of what's going to provide innervation of the vulva, it's the pudendal nerve predominantly. So the pudendal nerve um, is going to be coming from your sacral plexus. And in terms of what's supplying the vulva, in particular, it's going to be this perineal, perineal or perennial, you'll hear it either way. And particularly when you're talking about the clitoris, it's this dorsal nerve of the clitoris right here. That's going to be the, prom, or the dominant supply in this region. All right, so we've really gotten into the details of the internal genitalia structures of the female. Now let's talk about the external genitalia. And really when we're discussing this, we're talking about structures involved with the vestibule, and these really involve the orifices by which menstrual flow can exit as well as urine, and the clitoris, which is going to be the erectile tissue in this region. Now I'm not really gonna get into the details of the skin that's covering these structures, but what I really want to note is that all the, the genitalia in this region are going to have a, a very prominent supply in terms of sensory innervation. And this is of particular importance in terms of sexual arousal to allow for the engorgement of the erectile tissues of the clitoris.